Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update. Today, we continue with part two of a two-part series with Dr. Peter Hotez, who shares how he combats anti-science movements and how other physicians and medical students can join the fight. Well, when you have people uh, coming after you on social media, trolling you, do you have any specific advice for how you uh, interact with folks like that around hot topics? Yeah, thanks for that question. So what I do not do is I don't get into long arguments on Twitter or social media. I find that a very unproductive rabbit hole. Uh, you know, I try to get the information out there, but I don't typically engage, especially with the trolls, especially if people are very aggressive. Uh, I, Because I, it's a time sink. Before you know it, you've looked up at the clock and you spend 40 45 minutes doing this, and um, and th there are more important things uh, that you could be focusing on. So, I try to limit uh, the social media time. Uh, as Lady Gaga once uh, brilliantly said, when asked about social media, she said uh, she called it the toilet of the internet, and, uh, and to some extent, she's. I, I think she's right. So I try to invest efforts. I know I do some social media. I have a presence on Twitter, uh, but I, I try to you know, also focus on what I think are more productive aspects. So books, you know, I, I actually write single authored books, which I absolutely love, uh, or writing commentary pieces in biomedical journals, or even op-ed uh, pieces in newspapers. So using uh, using your uh, voice and your oral and written communication skills uh, in productive ways. So I kind of, with social media, I try to get in and out as uh, as fast as I can uh, in, in order to make those statements. Any uh, particular advice for medical students who might not have the same uh, restrictions that a, a physician might? Well, I'd say be careful uh, because you do have restrictions, and um, and social media can be a minefield if you're if you're not careful. So that's why I, I say you know get advice from your your office of communication. Say hey, look, uh, you know I want to be I want to get involved in public engagement. I want to be out there. Do you have some advice? I mean, they are professionals, and um, and you can, you can learn a lot from them. And, and they can help you, right? Especially if you want to put an op-ed piece in your local newspaper, that can have a very powerful impact and you can make a difference. I think it's also helpful to be able to distinguish policy from advocacy and be able to recognize the two. They're, 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 they certainly reinforce each other, but they're not always quite the same with policy more focused on shaping the actual legislation and advocacy and providing information uh, that can that can help inform on, on policy. Many people think of them as, as the same thing. And, you know, I'm often, uh, be, I'm basically an MD-PhD laboratory investigator developing vaccines, and people think that I'm also a policy expert. I'm not really. I'm, I'm ma mainly uh, doing advocacy around certain gap issues where I think there's a there's a hole, like for instance, not, you know, not d defending vaccines or making people aware about neglected diseases of poverty either in the U.S. or, or globally. So, so it's more, more advocacy informing policy. So having clear cut understanding of the difference and having discussions with experts at your medical school about policy and and, under, and and knowing what your goals are. So trying to be as specific in your objectives as you can in order to build a roadmap. Things will vary but and things will change, but at least having that roadmap could be extremely useful. Well, I see you know, a lot of physicians very comfortable with interacting with each other on social media platforms, but there's clearly, based on what you're saying, a need to you know, provide better instruction and guidance for how uh, physicians can take a bigger role on social media platforms and have their voice amplified. Um, I'm going to just turn quickly to one other topic. I want to talk to you about vaccine development. Um, you've been very active in coronavirus vaccine development. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, where do we stand and when do you think we'll have a viable vaccine? Right. So we have a recombinant protein vaccine that uh, we've developed, actually two vaccines that we're moving into uh, clinical trials, and ours is a global health vaccine because it's low cost, uses a microbial fermentation system. So we're hoping by uh, end of the year to be to be in clinical trials. Uh, in terms of uh, Operation Warp Speed in the U.S. government, 
I think you're starting to still start to see later this summer the first uh, vaccine starting to move into phase three trials. And I think over the course of the year, uh, it it'll, will hopefully start collecting enough, enough information on the efficacy of these vaccines and the safety of these vaccines. So maybe by third quarter 2021, we can have some of these vaccines released to the public. Uh, you know, we're hearing a lot of misinformation about we'll have vaccines in weeks or months or by the fall or before the election. And I, I don't see a path by which which that happens. The good news is there will be vaccines. I think the uh, intellectual exercise of developing a COVID-19 vaccine is not that complicated. We need to induce an immune response against the spike protein, especially neutralizing antibodies. And if we do that, we'll, we'll, have, a, we'll have a COVID-19 vaccine. It's sort of an old school problem in virology, but we have to give it adequate time to collect that e efficacy and safety testing data. And once we do have that vaccine, obviously uh, the fear of vaccines, something that's not new, and I know that's something you've been dealing with uh, for a long time, uh, is going to be a factor. Several articles have already suggested that a certain percentage of the population may not be willing to get a vaccine for COVID-19, uh, even when it's available. So what's important for people to know and how should uh, physicians address potential vaccine fears? Yeah, you're right. Uh, the just two studies coming out of the Associated Press and, and Reuters are finding up to half of Americans won't accept COVID-19 vaccines, even, even if they're made available. And my my premise is that we sort of created this mess uh, by this term, Operation Warp Speed. It gives the impression that we're rushing uh, our clinical trials. Uh, and then you have all of the, you know, we've been hearing about with some of the biotech, some of the conflicts of interest and stock dumping. And uh, let's remember what the anti-vaccine movement is based on. On the one, they claim vaccines cause autism, and I spent a lot of time fighting that and, and getting that OG villain moniker uh, because I wrote a book, Vaccines Did Not Cause Rachel's Autism. But then the other things they claim is we rush vaccines, we don't test them adequately for safety, and there's this conspiratorial relationship between the pharma companies and the government. And so unfortunately, the way this has rolled out and the way the messaging has been has really played into that. And so we've got to take steps not to be so tone deaf and and uh, and and change, you know, how we are explaining things and how we communicate to the public. Well, thank you very much. We really appreciate your efforts to correct misinformation. Well, that concludes part two of our two part series with Dr. Hotez. Thank you so much for being with us here today and sharing your perspective. If you missed part one, you can find it on AMA's YouTube channel. We'll be back on Monday with another COVID-19 update. In the meantime, for resources on COVID-19, visit ama-assn.org slash COVID-19. Thanks for being with us here today and take care.